Hello everyone, and welcome back to Crusader Kings 2. Uh, in this episode, we're going to try and expand our realm. But as we already established, uh, we have no chance of winning a war against any of our neighboring kingdoms. In fact, most of our neighbors are our allies, so we wouldn't want to fight them anyway. Uh, so who are we going to fight? Uh, ourselves, specifically our vassal. Uh, Duke Anzar of Alto Aragon. Um, this is not the, an ideal situation, but he controls half of our territory, and we can't really afford to allow that to continue. So let's take a look at the Duke. Um, if we look at the Realm Tree, uh, you can see that the Duke here is has got 1,500 troops compared to our 900. And considering that that 900 includes the troops that the Duke is giving us, uh, the balance is even more tilted in his favor. So Duke Anzar is basically a threat to the realm. Even though he's currently our friend with a 56 opinion, uh, we sh do not want him in power very long. Uh, his heir is technically our grandson, but... Um, he is part of his father's dynasty. So, uh, you know, this is a lot of territory, uh, relatively speaking, that is not in our hands, and we want it. Um, we have a few options about what to do with the Duke, uh, but before we do that, let's take a look at the laws. We want to change our laws uh, because, well, we're going to piss a lot of our vassals off uh, pretty soon and we're not going to have a chance to change the laws after that. Okay, so um, this is the law screen, and it is useful for uh, changing the way things in your kingdom work. Uh, not by a heck of a lot, because you're still playing Crusader Kings, regardless of what your laws are, uh, but they can change your, uh, out your strategy and outlook. Um, at the top half, is your succession laws. The bottom half are your kingdom laws. Um, most of your kingdom laws are regarded uh, regard uh, levy and tax rates. Um, there are three different types of holdings, feudal holdings, castles, um, cities, and churches. Um, you know, you can tax each of these more and you can levy more troops from them. Uh, usually you'll um, get more troops from feudal levies and more taxes from cities. Uh, churches are hit and miss. Um, your church vassals, let's take a look at our vassals here. Uh, we've got one church vassal, uh, Beltran, the Bishop of Lair. Uh, they provide you troops and gold, but only if their opinion of you is higher than their opinion of the Pope. So he has uh, 86 opinion of me and 54 opinion of the Pope. So he is per currently providing me with troops and gold, uh, but um, that will change. So back to the laws. Okay, um, succession law is probably your most important uh, type of law because it determines um, your survivability as a kingdom. All right. So the different types of succession laws are up here in the top half of the law screen. Um, we, let's take a look at these one by one. Our current succession law is agnatic cognatic gavel kind, which is a mouthful. Um, agnatic cognatic is the gender law that we're currently operating under, and gavel kind is the succession law that we're currently operating under. Uh, there are three gender laws, agnatic, Agnatic, Cognatic, and Absolute Cognatic. Uh, each of them has their different advantages and disadvantages. Um, ag agnatic is males only inherit, uh, which seems like a disadvantage because if you run out of sons because they get killed or you just are unlucky enough to have no sons, uh, then you don't have anyone to inherit, which means your uh, dynasty is more brittle. Um, but the advantage of uh, Agnatic is that uh, your titles are less likely to pass out of your dynasty. Uh, if your dynasty survives at all, 
uh, your titles are less likely to, to pass out of it. That's because when two characters get married, um, unless you arrange a special matriarchal marriage, uh, the children have the same dynasty as the father. So if you have a daughter that inherits, um, then uh, if she's already married, her children have a different dynasty than yours. And if those children inherit your primary titles, uh, you're in a lot of trouble. Um, if there's no one else in your dynasty who has a title that's still alive, then that's game over. Uh, so um, Agnatic uh, can help you in some ways. Like instead of going to your daughter, it'll go to like an uncle or a, a nephew or a grandson. Um, that can be tricky because uh, you don't necessarily know those people. They could be halfway across the map in another land. Um, but it does prevent uh, territories from leaving your your uh, your control as a player. Um, agnatic cognatic is a compromise. It means only males can inherit unless there's no valid males in your immediate bloodline. In which case, um, uh, you know your daughter would inherit in front of your son, um, or in front of like your nephew or brother or something. Um, absolute cognatic means men and women uh, inherit on equal terms. And that means that, uh, you know, whatever your rule for uh, how your titles are passed down, uh, your women are considered valid for it too. Um, agnatic, uh, absolute cognatic uh, can be pretty risky uh, because that doesn't change uh, the marriage laws. Uh, but if you're careful and make sure that uh, your daughters only get matriarchal marriages, um, it can be pretty handy. Keeps things in the family, uh, in your immediate family, um, with a greater degree of certainty. Uh, I want to go with absolute cognatic uh, because that's the whole reason I chose the Basque culture in the first place. Um, as you can see, uh, only a few cultures get it. Um, well, one culture and two religions. Uh, so Basque culture, or you have to be a Cathar, or a Messalian, Messalian uh, in order to be absolute cognatic. Um, and succession laws, uh, they determine how titles are inherited. Right now we've got Gavelkind, which is a really tricky succession law to deal with. Um, all when Under Gavelkind, whenever you die, uh, all of your titles are split up and distributed amongst your heirs. Uh, we only have one title at the moment, so Gavelkind is probably actually pretty good for us uh, because uh, it ensures that your unlanded sons don't give you a prestige penalty and your domain can be bigger. Um, you want Gavelkind if you're a conqueror and you're constantly getting new lands and new titles, uh, which would not be terrible for us in Iberia because we've got a lot of... Uh, um, Muslim titles we could steal, but uh, I don't like it. Uh, it makes your rivals in the kingdom too powerful, um, and it makes your realm too unstable. So next up is uh, alternative uh, succession laws that we could do. Uh, seniority, which its advantage is that... Um, no, it has an advantage. I know what it is. I'm... I'm blanking out on it at the moment. Seniority is the oldest member of your dynasty inherits all of your titles, uh, which means that um, you will be constantly inheriting titles from your other dynasty members, and uh, your realm will be intact from generation to generation. Uh, that's good because it means your liege will always be powerful, your character will, uh, but it also means that um, it's likely that old people will inherit. And there's nothing wrong with old people inheriting, except that they don't rule for very long. When you start a rule, uh, your vassals don't trust you. Uh, you get a penalty for, uh, to their opinions for having a short rule, um, and that penalty goes away over time. Uh, with seniority, um, it's likely that your successor will not have time to eliminate the penalty. Uh, primogeniture, is your oldest child inherits everything. 
primogeniture is good for keeping your realm intact and uh, you know general stability and it's a favored uh, um, succession law for a lot of people who are experienced at the game uh, the downside of that is that your heir your oldest son might be an idiot and then you have an issue um, there are ways to deal with older children uh, you know you can uh, send them to the church or um, you know kill them uh, but those all have downsides as well elective monarchy is pretty powerful because that means you get to choose your heir uh, from amongst uh, your vassals or your children uh, naturally you'd want to uh, do it with your children um, or your brother or something uh, so that you keep the titles in your dynasty um, but uh, the disadvantage is that your vassals get to vote too and uh, you know sometimes they like uh, other candidates more than your chosen candidate like um, our vassal the Duke Anzo is eligible under elective uh, under elective and that means that uh, if we had other vassals who liked him more than us we could potentially lose the kingdom to him uh, we're gonna probably go with that anyway because it's it's a real powerful uh, succession law and we're going to disinherit Anzo uh, but there's risks ultimogeniture is uh, the opposite of primogeniture it means your youngest child inherits uh, it has the same realm preserving uh, aspects of primogeniture um, but it's got some disadvantages as well namely that your youngest child is likely to be an actual child and your vassals really don't like it when there's a child on the throne uh, the whole kingdom becomes unstable uh, while that happens uh, the advantage of ultimogeniture is that uh, you're also almost guaranteed to have monarchs who reign for a long time the longer you reign the more popular you are so um, we're going to go with elective monarchy um, this is going to change our vassals opinion of us the vassals who stand to benefit will like us more and characters who stand to lose will like us less um, you can only change one of your inheritance laws per generation so uh, we're going to go with elective monarchy just to get rid of gavel kind because uh, it is not good for us at this time um, next generation will go to absolute cognatic um, you know. then the other thing we uh, have are these two crown laws here crown authority and investiture uh, remember we we're talking earlier about how uh, your church vassals will um, you know uh, give their troops and gold to the pope if they like him more than they like you well investiture allows you to hand pick uh, your bishops so that they like you more uh, than they like the Pope. You choose bishops who have compatible personalities or you can send unwanted children into the priesthood to disinherit them. Uh, free investiture is generally better than papal investiture in every way. Uh, papal investiture is where the Pope chooses the bishops. Uh, the disadvantage of free investiture is that the Pope hates you if you choose it. Um, so you you know, the Pope is so powerful that free investiture is balanced against papal. Um, you want to choose which one based on your circumstances. Since we don't want to piss off the Pope this early in the game, we'll leave it at papal investiture. A crown authority is the other main law. Uh, it goes from minimum, uh, where your vassals are virtually autonomous, and uh, absolute, uh, the maximum, where your vassals basically have no power whatsoever. Now, the higher your authority, the bigger your levies are when you call your levies. Um, and you also gain other privileges with higher laws. Uh, so going to li limited would allow us to revoke the titles and appoint army leaders. And then medium would allow us to revoke infidel titles and our vassals can no longer fight each other, which we don't have enough vassals for that to be an issue. Uh, but once your kingdom gets bigger, you'll probably want to go to medium crown authority to prevent your vassals from gaining power.
power blocks within your realm. High Crown Authority uh, also ensures that vassal titles can no longer pass outside of the realm uh, via inheritance, which is handy. Um, because, you know, uh, your vassals might marry unwisely. And then uh, Absolute Crown Authority ensures that your vassals can no longer declare war against outside enemies, which is a mixed blessing. It embroils you in fewer wars, but it also means that your vassals are less likely to expand your territory of their own initiative. So you really only want a maximum crown authority when you yourself are so powerful uh, that uh, this incidental expansion will not help you very much. Uh, we're going to go to low uh, because um, it's usually worthwhile to increase it at least to medium. And you, this is another thing that you can only do once in your lifetime. So we've uh, instituted low crown authority. Uh, the higher your crown authority, the less your vassals like you. This is usually uh, balanced out by your increased authority. And then we're also going to go to elective monarchy. Uh, we want to do that because you can only de uh, change your uh, inheritance laws if your vassals like you. And we're about to piss off our vassals by uh, going after Duke Anzo's land. Um, so. With elective monarchy, we can now nominate one of our children, but let's take a look at our children's stats. Um, Prince Fortune is good at stewardship uh, and pretty mediocre at everything else. Um, his brother, uh, Prince Anso, is uh, good at fighting, but pretty terrible at everything else. So I think we're going to go with uh, Prince Fortune. Uh, he still needs some diplomacy, but I think he's a better choice. So, go back to Laws, nominate uh, Prince Fortune. He is our designated heir. There are no pretenders, because nobody else in the kingdom has uh, the authority to nominate someone except the Duke of Anso. He's not going to be a Duke for long. Uh, well, that is where I'm going to stop for today. Uh, next episode... Uh, we will finally get to some action. Uh, so until then, uh, good luck.